Greetings, blessings, grace, and peace to all of the Connected Church fam. This is Charles Botts, the founder and pastor here at Connected Church, and I am thrilled, honored, humbled, grateful that you would once again join us on the Connected Podcast This is our, uh, can I say, semi-weekly, trying to get to the spot where we're weekly. Um, We're more kind of bi-weekly at this point, twice a month, a podcast where we uh, do our Bible study for Connected Church and uh, other things as we look to expand and grow uh, this audience and this content in the future. Uh, But for now, it has been a great vehicle for us in terms of helping us to broadcast and promote um, our Bible study. And so we're so grateful for those of you that tune in um, every time we have a new episode. Thank you for downloading. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for rating and reviewing us and giving us those five-star ratings. You know we need them. We know you know we love them, and we're so grateful to you for continuing to keep that love coming our way, for growing the Connected Podcast, growing our following, and our influence uh, in the podcast space. So much content out there, so much for you to listen to, the fact that you continue to download and to consume the Connected Podcast makes us feel just so humble here, and we are so grateful. And so with that, I want to respect your time. I want to um, get right to things and to continue the work that we've been doing the last several weeks and months. Uh, We have been answering the question, the question, guys, the the only question uh, out there, why Jesus? Why Jesus? Why do we love Jesus? Why do we follow Jesus? Why do we believe Jesus is Lord? And we have been peeling back the layers and building the case, answering the question, why Jesus? And this past Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, and if you were able to join us for our Sunday session live on Facebook, I believe you were blessed. I believe that you experienced a real treat, and I Uh, If you haven't had an opportunity to listen, if you weren't able to listen in live, uh, I want you to go to our YouTube channel. Uh, You will find the uh, broadcast of uh, Sunday's Pentecost Sunday service on our YouTube channel. I want you to go to myconnectedchurch.com and you can get it from there as well. It's a great listen. It's a great watch. The Lord ministered through us and spoke mightily to everyone that was listening, including you, who's going to listen uh, right after we finish with this podcast. I know it. I know we're gonna. You're gonna come out of this podcast and you're gonna go right to uh, the Pentecost Sunday session uh, at Connected Church. So, what we did uh, with the the uh, Pentecost Sunday service was we explained, we broke down, we really dug into the impact that Pentecost had, Pentecost Sunday had on the expansion of Christianity and more importantly, the piece of the puzzle to the why Jesus uh, equation, the variables that uh, Pentecost Sunday solved for. And so we spent some time, again, I'm not going to go through all of that here. We certainly want you to check out that episode um, and get that content for yourself. But I think it is important, it is helpful to um, uh, lay a bit of a foundation because we're actually going to build, we're going to continue on um, uh, with that uh, word because we actually believe it or not we didn't get to everything Sunday and so we're going to give you a little bit more to tack on to what we did Sunday and so what we did Sunday was we started by looking back and setting the the, the groundwork for the Sermon on the Mount the Sermon on the Mount is where Jesus um, it, it does the teaching um, uh, many times it's referred to as the Beatitudes 
um, uh, that Jesus is teaching from uh, on the sermon, and, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. And so there were a couple things that we, we need to look at and recognize right away. Firstly, that that location, the location, the environment, the context in which Jesus delivers that sermon is very meant so is is very much supposed to remind us it's meant to remind us of Moses at Sinai when Moses gets the law from God that Jesus chose that location he chose that place deliberately intentionally to hearken back the Jews in the region immediately as Jesus is going up to this high place and they're following immediately they start to go back into their minds and begin to 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 almost transport themselves back in time to experience what the Israelites experienced while Moses was up uh, in Sinai up in the summit of Sinai and then as he descends with the great law from God. And so Jesus is, is echoing that um, and, and taking them back there. And so Jesus ministers. He preaches to the crowd, and he's preaching to the crowd following what Matthew tells us in chapter 4, which is after John the Baptist's imprisonment. And we do a whole bit on... John the Baptist and 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 how Isaiah prophesies of John and what the significance of that is and and the significance of God declaring Jesus to be his son after John baptizes him and brings him up out of the Jordan River and Jesus goes into the wilderness and then John is arrested and we really go into great detail um so again uh, absolutely worth your time to download Sunday's episode so um a, a, John is arrested and Jesus kicks off his ministry with John's arrest. Jesus does not begin to minister. He does not begin to preach openly. He does not begin to preach publicly in a very public, noticeable way until John's arrest. There's a baton. There's a handoff there. John was baptizing into repentance. John was preparing the way. And then Jesus comes who is the way. Right? John is preparing the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the light. And so Jesus uh, begins his public preaching, his public ministry, with the phrase in Matthew 4, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is how Jesus kicks off his ministry. Jesus came to bring God's kingdom to earth. That was the purpose of for Jesus coming to earth was to bring God's kingdom to earth. And so, Jesus kicks off his ministry with this announcement, with this declaration. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus goes up to the mountain, to the hill, um, and and preaches. And starts with what we uh, become to know as the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5 Verse 2, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they are comforted. Comforted, excuse me. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, the peacemakers. They'll be called the sons of God. Those are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven because they persecuted the prophets before you. And then he goes into salt and light. You're the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its taste, chapter uh, 5 still, verse 13, how shall its saltiness be restored? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hid, verse 15. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. 
And then Christ goes on. So again, remember, this is going back to Moses. Moses brings the law. So then Christ is laying this foundation. And now Christ starts to take on the law. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Verse 17, I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them, to complete them. That's what fulfill means here, to complete the law, to add fullness, to to bring about a completion, a conclusion to the law. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember that the scribes and the Pharisees were kind of the standard. They were the gold standard. Uh, they were the religious elite, the teachers, the 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 inscribers of the law. Uh, they set a standard that just seemed almost unattainable. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, "Your righteousness needs to exceed theirs if you're going to be a part of this kingdom that I'm bringing." And then begins to break down and present. A more rigorous law. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, listen to this, that everyone who is angry, verse 22, with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, verse 24, there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. The law says you shall not murder. I say this is what God is saying through Jesus. There's a higher standard. People were so blown away by the law, this, this, this unattainable kind of gold standard. And Jesus comes along and says, there's still yet a higher calling. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. I tell you, you cannot bear that resentment or anger in your heart. He goes on, look at verse 27. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you... Everyone who looks at a woman with lust intent, lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Do you see what's happening here, family? Do you see what's happening? Now, we're going to get to Pentecost. We're going to get to how that answers the question of why Jesus. But we need to understand, you need to get this foundation. Jesus picks a location and a spot to remind the Jewish nation, to remind the Hebrew people of Moses, and then goes and completely flips the script and says that you were used to living life this way. Well, if you want to enter into the kingdom, you got to take your game up to the next level. You cannot simply be idle followers of the law. You cannot simply go through the motions. Not murdering is not enough. Not committing adultery is not enough. To live and be a part of God's kingdom, there is a higher calling. There is more to be done. And then how do we get there? That's where Pentecost comes in. That's where Calvary comes in. That's where the resurrection comes in. That's where Christ disappearing before the eyes of his disciples comes in and sends the comforter, sends the spirit of comfort that will never leave us comfortless, sends the spirit that will lead and guide us into all truth. 
Christ in Matthew chapter 5 on the mount is setting the framework. He's making the case that there is a standard required of humanity that cannot be met in and of humanity's own willfulness, humanity's own good works, humanity's own desire to keep this standard. It cannot be done. Humanity does not have the capacity to meet the standard. Humanity does not have the capacity to to reach this benchmark, to enter into God's kingdom without help, without support, without the Spirit of Christ. That's why Pentecost is so critical. That's why Pentecost is, is, is right there in terms of significance for Christians with the resurrection. There's the resurrection as the greatest day on earth and Pentecost is shortly behind it. Because without the Holy Spirit being poured out on all humanity, without the Holy Spirit being readily available to all of us at the request, at our request, without the Holy Spirit being available upon request, we do not have the ability to enter into God's kingdom. We cannot enter into God's kingdom. We cannot get to the place where we are able to keep the standard that Christ outlined in Matthew chapter 5. And so we 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 then we we transition and we begin to appreciate what's happening and what was foretold leading up to Pentecost. Go to Joel. Joel chapter 2, one of the the so-called minor prophets. He's only considered a minor prophet because his writings um, are, are less than the writings of Isaiah or Jeremiah or Daniel. Uh, but the content is by no means minor. Um, Joel offers... An incredible prophecy. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Just stop there and breathe that in. This is what Pentecost is. This is Joel is prophesying about the day of Pentecost, about those coming together, going into the upper room, getting on one page, on one accord, praying and worshiping together and waiting for that promise. Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Now, keep that in mind, and let's go to Acts chapter 2 and see if you don't see this parallel. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, the disciples, Christ's followers, were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit 
gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem. Listen to this. Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, they were there for the Feast of Tabernacles. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them, those that were together in the upper room, speak in his own language. Now I was inserting some of my commentary in there, so I hope I didn't lose you in the reading. But what's happening here? So they get together and they experience what Joel prophesied that the spirit was poured out on them. And notice what how Luke describes it. Luke, the writer of Acts, describes it as divided tongues of fire appearing on each of them individually every individual was touched individually by the holy spirit to receive the gift so each of them received the gift each of them received the holy spirit and as the holy spirit came in each of them is then endowed with this power and this gift comes forward and they speak in a language they don't know through the power, the unctioning of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes control of their tongues and they speak as the Spirit gives them the utterance. They speak as the Spirit inspires them, empowers them, um, and, and motivates them to do, to speak. And so, at the time, in Jerusalem, it's the Feast of the Tabernacles. It's the Pentecost celebration. That's why we call it Pentecost Sunday. It was the Pentecost celebration. So there were Jews all over the region. Jews representing the diaspora of the Hebrew uh, nation, of the Israelite experience. There are Jews from former Babylon. There are Jews from Persia. There are Jews from Greece. There are Jews from all over, Jews that have been, that, that as part of the exiles, when the Jew, when Jerusalem fell, when the Jewish nation was divided and split apart, there were Jews that ran and hid and went to various areas and places of, uh, uh, of the region of that part of the world. And grew up and grew up in in other parts of the world outside of Israel in that immediate area. And so they took on the language and the culture. They took on the dominant language and the dominant culture of where they were living. They maintained their Jewish faith. They maintained their practices. They held to the to the to the to the teachings and the scrolls and the law, the scrolls of the prophet and the law of Moses and and held on to their to their faith, their belief in the one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. But they took on the language, they took on the culture of where they were living. So they arrive in Jerusalem, and they and 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 there there are clear ethnic differences. Remember, generations generations have passed. It's been a millennia or more since the exile. And so you have Jewish people from from various parts of the world that are ethnically very diverse. Some have darker skin, some have lighter skin, fairer features, um, a stronger features, uh, uh, all sorts of, of ethnic, uh, uh, national, um, a, a diversity in their in their appearance, in their culture, in their language, in their dialect. So they arrive in Jerusalem and they know, they know who speaks their language and who doesn't. And they hear this sound, they hear this this noise to come from this house. And they're drawn, they're immediately drawn because they hear this noise and they start to recognize these languages. It's like a United Nations delegation, and, but it's all, it's a United Nations delegation, but all the delegates are from the same area. All the delegates are, 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 are Bostonians, but all of a sudden 
the 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 Chinese Jews are hearing Chinese and the Korean Jews are hearing Korean and 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 the Jews from from uh, 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 from uh, Nigeria are hearing Twi and 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 the Jews from uh, from uh, 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 Turkey are hearing uh, Arabic and the Jews from uh, uh, Moscow are hearing Russian. They're 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 converging on this home because there's no way these Jews from Galilee could possibly know their language and know it so well and know it so fluently and 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 have the right accent speaking it as if it was their first language speaking as if they grew up speaking this language how is this possible and so some are blown away and they and they immediately acknowledge and recognize it as a miracle and yet others doubt and so peter stands up and begins to preach and Peter begins to preach and say, this is the thing that was prophesied. And now he's talking about the scrolls. And now, regardless of where you grew up and where and where you are from and how you are raised, now he's talking about fundamental elements of Judaism. He's talking about the scrolls. And he's immediately got everybody's attention. This is the thing that was prophesied. And so the Holy Spirit comes to give us this power. It comes to give us this power to do what? To share the good news with other people. What's the first thing that the disciples in the upper room did when they were blessed, when they were endowed, when the comforter came, when the spirit of truth came? What was the first thing they did? They began to minister. They began to witness. They began to share the good news with others in a language that was not their own. The Holy Spirit comes with a purpose, family. The Holy Spirit comes with the purpose of helping us to build God's kingdom here on earth, to participate, to be a part of the kingdom that Jesus said he was bringing. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Holy Spirit comes to give us access to the kingdom of heaven and to provide a way to help others to enter the kingdom with us. The Holy Spirit did not come so that we as individuals could enter the kingdom alone. No, ma'am, no, sir, no way. The Holy Spirit came so that we could enter God's kingdom and bring some folks with us. That's why the Holy Spirit came. And so we look at what's happening in the upper room and previously... When there was an example of someone, of individuals being endowed with this miraculous power, it was Jesus breathing the Spirit on his disciples and sending them out two by two. And so that is one of the earlier examples in Christ's life and in his ministry, his work, he's sending his disciples out to prepare towns and cities across the region for his arrival. And so he, he breathes on them that ruach, that breath, that life, that, that's the that's the breath, that's the ruach that God breathed into Adam in Genesis chapter 1 when Adam became a nethesh, a living soul. It's that same ruach that fell on those that were in the upper room. It's that power, that, that life-bringing power. And so when they receive the Holy Spirit, 
they could go into the world and they could share the miracle of Jesus' spirit on earth contained within these earthen vessels, the creative power, the same power that, that spoke life into being was imparted into these disciples and so they could then go forward and do miracles and, and perform these mighty works because of the spirit that was in them. And so they would do miracles and they would perform these mighty acts to, to demonstrate that their words are truth. That what they were speaking is truth. And that they were preparing for the arrival of the anointed one that was going to show them the way to God's kingdom. So Christ sends his spirit in the form of a comforter to be with us always in the same way that Christ could not physically be with us. Now the Holy Spirit and, and through the Holy Spirit, Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, is now accessible to all humanity at all times. And that power is in believers to share the good news. That power, the Holy Spirit power, empowers us as believers to share Christ with all the world. So when the Holy Spirit falls on them in the upper room, together the Holy Spirit fills them with this breath of life, they breathe out, and when they exhale, they speak in a language they don't know. And so that power, that ruach, speaks in them and speaks through them. And so the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, comes into those that receive the Holy Spirit. And then when they breathe out these words, when they breathe out the power, they are, they are breathing out the ruach, of God onto others. Do you see that? We talked about how the Holy Spirit Sunday is like a contagious infection in a good way that you breathe on someone and the droplets, the particles, the germs in a negative sense that you have when something is airborne, you breathe on someone and they breathe in and they take those particles, they take those germs into themselves. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in a positive sense. The Holy Spirit becomes God's breath. It's God's breath breathing through us that allow the Spirit to work through us. And so as the Spirit is, is deposited in me, as that breath comes in me, I inhale that breath and then I exhale that ruach. As I breathe in the Holy Spirit, I breathe out the Holy Spirit, and I breathe out the Holy Spirit onto others. And as I breathe out the Holy Spirit onto others, they breathe in the Holy Spirit, and they take it in. And then they can then, in turn, breathe it out onto others. The Holy Spirit empowers Christ believers to spread the gospel to Judea and Samaria and to the rest of the world. And some 2,000 years later, the infection of the Holy Spirit is still going strong. And so in order for God's kingdom to have fully come to earth, as we start to bring our podcast to a close for this week, there's a couple things that we need to know. There's a couple things that had to happen in order for the Holy Spirit to come to earth and then be spread abroad to all those who want it, that look for it. First, Jesus had to give up. John 10, 17 and 18 says, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. 
only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Jesus had to give up. He had to surrender his life for you and I. After Jesus had to give up, next he had to be raised up. He had to be lifted up on the cross. John three fourteen. just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. After he was lifted up, he had to be laid down in a tomb. Mark 15, verse 46. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, laid down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Christ had to be laid down into a tomb. Then what happened? Jesus lay down for three days, but on the third day, he had to get up. So he was laid down, but then he had to get up. Mark 16, verse 6 and 7, Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So after he had to get up, finally, before God's work through Christ could be entirely finished, Jesus had to go up. John 14, verse 1 and 2. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you? I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So in order for the Holy Spirit to be available for you and I today in 2021, Jesus had to give up. He had to be raised up. He had to be laid down. He had to uh, uh, get up and then he had to go up. He had to give up, be raised up, be laid down. He had to get up and then he had to go up. Amen. And because Jesus did all that, you and I now have access to the Holy Spirit. We have access to that same breath, to that same power, the same power that raised Jesus up is now available to you and I. That same power that raised Jesus up is now available to you and I. It is available upon request, but there is a catch. When we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, when we work our way into God's kingdom, we cannot enter God's kingdom alone. When we breathe in the Holy Spirit, we need to breathe out the Holy Spirit on others. We need to spread the beautiful infection of God's Spirit all over this earth so that everyone knows Jesus, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, our Heavenly Father. Family, I'm so grateful to you. I appreciate you spending another uh, a week with us here on the Connected Podcast, the Bible study of my Connected Church. We are so grateful for your prayers. We're so grateful for all your support. We're so grateful for your investment in us. Please don't forget to share this with someone. Let somebody know about the good news of Jesus Christ uh, and what he has done for us and continuing, continuing to do for us each and every day. We appreciate you. We care about you very much. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay in this fight. God bless, fam. Take care.